Electrical injuries. Mm. Okay, so this is one of my heebie-jeebie places. I yeah. think electricity is just scary as hell. <laughs> I just, I don't know. My husband likes to work on electrical stuff. I always, I think I get zapped once as a kid and oh. I'm just like scarred for life. So electrical injuries, we need to know about these. And, and a couple of things we need to know about these is wh like which ones are really bad. Yeah. Um, some of them are obviously really bad, but some of them that you don't think they're that bad may be really bad. And what to do about them when somebody comes in and says, I got zapped while I was plugging in the toaster. <laughs> so, so, and honestly, you don't need to know all the physics of electricity. You don't need to know all of this jazz of voltage and current and resistance. Just know that when electric electricity comes through your body, it likes certain parts of your body more than others. And certain parts of your body block it like a resistor. So it really likes things like your nerves. And that makes sense, right? Your nerves are sort of electrical. We do it not this exact way, but similar concept, super fast. Blood vessels they like, it likes to travel down those really fast. Not a lot of resistance there, but boy, it hits bone and it stops, it can't go very far. And what happens when it stops is it heats it up. So your bones, if you really have a true bad electric, electrical event, your bones heat up. And so you can end up with some things like things cooking right around bones. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that you have a, a both a, an electrical injury, but you can also have a heat injury that can happen at the same time when somebody has an electrical injury. We know a couple concepts that are important. AC, alternating current, is worse than DC, direct current. And the reason is direct current kind of hits you once and goes. Boom. But AC, because it's alternating, it's doing this -na 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 thing, it can, there's a thing called a let go current where you grab and you get, you, you contract and you relax, and you contract and you relax, and, but you can't ever relax enough to let go of the thing. So you now are hanging on to this, whatever this electrical thing is, and you can't let go. AC is worse than DC. And as far as wounds are concerned, um, DC has a blast out. It has, it's just not super big in the, in the initial place, but it blasts out. AC, basically, if, there's, if there are wounds, and sometimes there really aren't, you will have about the same at both places. And, and so AC is worse than DC. The other thing is, and this makes sense, duh, high voltage is worse than low voltage. Now, the, the issue is though, low voltage can, can still kill you. High voltage is bad, but low voltage can still kill you. So let's talk about this. Basically, uh, the amount you get, how long you get it, whether it's AC or DC, um, whether it, what the voltage itself is, that's that am amount of it, and then the path it goes through will tell you what kind of things could have happened to somebody. And externally what we see is often way less than what happened inside that's terrible. Um, all the, again, remember, it's all these organs that go, it's going through, it meets resistance in some, they get hot, some of them it travels just fine. It doesn't, your electrical system isn't thrilled about being challenged by another bad electrical thing. So you end up with a lot of things that can be damaged here. And if you happen to be dumb enough to be standing in water when you get electrocuted, this is the whole, you know, what women want movie with Mel Gibson where he's in the bathtub and a blow, you know, a dryer ends up landing in the bathtub and electrocutes him. Water is not a good idea to have electricity. It goes great through water and it can electrocute you as well. So that's bad. And we also know that people can have falls, particularly with direct voltage injuries, you know, where they basically get a big zap of something. They can fall off whatever they were on and have damage done from trauma as well. Here's kind of a summary table of the different kinds of low voltage and high voltage situations that you have and sort of lightning's like the ultimate of the direct current kind of thing. Um, this gives you sort of the, the, the versions of this. Low voltage is more a prolonged thing because you can't let go. High voltage is like a brief wham, you're done kind of thing. And the injuries really vary depending on those. Low voltage injury, low voltage injuries are, are defined as less than 600 volts at a time um, and, uh, of the current itself. These are much more common. This is your house is sort of part of this. Your house is 110 or 220, depending where you live. This is most injuries and deaths. Okay, this is just a lot of them because it, there are a lot of these that happen. We may never see a burn in somebody who has a significant injury from this thing, and it can cause cardiac arrest and it's usually V-fib arrest when they get it. So they go into ventricular fibrillation. They've touched the wire or put their hand in with the with the um, blow dryer going on into water and they end up with this electrocution that they get that throws them into a VF arrest. High voltage is different. This is that thing that's behind your house, those gigantic wires that are behind your house that are supplying the entire neighborhood. These basically zap you. You get one massive muscle contraction because everything gets depolarized all at once and it throws you. So these are people that often have trauma, for both the, from the muscle contraction initially, which causes things like fractures and dislocations, to things that are thrown where they end up with uh, other massive kinds of trauma. I'll tell you the classic testable, I actually does happen in real life, injury that happens with people 
people with direct currents are shoulder dislocations, usually sh posterior shoulder dislocations. We'll talk about those as we go through trauma and ortho later, but posterior dislocations are easy to miss, and if you're distracted by the electrocution, you may end up missing that injury itself. If people go into cardiac arrest from a big kind of high voltage injury, they go into asystole. The heart just says, done, you win, I quit, and you go into asystole. So VF is the low voltage, asystole is the high voltage. And if they do survive it, they often have a lots of dysrhythmias. The heart is like, what just happened? Oh, I'm going to have a PAC or an S you know, SVD, or this is just what just happened. Basically, really, really throws the heart. So the treatment for electrical injuries, first of all, remember, you had this massive contraction. So you're going to send your usual labs, but you're going to add something like a CK because rhabdo's in there. So remember, you're going to add something like a CK to this thing and watch the urine and make sure that they don't have any problem with having rhabdo and problems with the urine. You're going to image appropriately, especially high voltage people who might have trauma were thrown. You're going to worry about those shoulders, like traumatic injuries. And then you are going to monitor people. Now, the question is, do you have to admit them all? We're going to look at that EKG. The more dysrhythmia is, the more abnormal that EKG is, the more likely we're going to keep them around. But if it's somebody who had a house, I touched the, you know, a wire coming out of the wall because the plug didn't come out right. The little wire thing was stuck in there. I touched it. I felt that woo, awful feeling. I felt that. But they have no burn. They have no other complaints. Their EKG is normal. They have no underlying medical problems. That person can go home. You don't keep that person around. So a lot of people will stay if they have a very significant exposure. But you're going to be sending a lot of these people home. Now, some specific things that go with uh, electrical injuries. This is one they love to test on this, too. It's yeah. just little kids who chew on the cord, and they get some bleeding at the c corner of their mouth. And so the thing to know about this is that they may have gotten their, in the oral commissure there, they may have gotten their labial artery. And while you may put pressure and it may, uh, you know, you may get hemostasis initially, as that uh, eschar and that little scab starts to shrink down and heal, it can re-bleed again. And that's the thing to know about it. And it usually happens in the, you know, this time period which is around a week, week to 10 days, and it can happen. So you got to tell people, like, if this re-bleeds, this can be really serious, and you want to give them decent follow-up for that, whether it be, you know, plastic surgery and give them good instructions, like, if it bleeds, it's going to be an arterial bleed, so you're going to need to pinch it, et cetera. Right. And, you know, exactly. You can consider admission, but often, like, what are you admitting them for? If the for bleed, five days? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, if they're hemostatic, there's no. not much to admit them for. Yeah. But you want to know that that can happen and, and give parents the If you have a reason for the electrical injury, fine, yeah, but sure, not for sure. that itself. Yeah, that's right. Now, lightning injuries, ooh, very, very interesting. These Obviously, are fascinating. this is a massive direct current electrical shock. It usually is very, very brief. Often it just passes over the body. I have no idea what it must feel like. It must be crazy. Well, we're getting, so this used to be never happened in California because yeah. we're both from California, yeah. but now we're having actually real thunderstorms. And this actually picture was taken from a California beach where somebody died wow. from getting electric, from getting lightning struck. Yeah. Bad day. Now, if it strikes you directly, that's obviously the most serious if you actually get hit, but you don't have to be directly hit to get injured by lightning. You can have these like side flash, like you were in proximity to where the lightning hit or that you were holding a flagpole that hit the top of the flagpole and you were in contact with that, you know, conductor. Or it could be that it hits the ground and it's wet and there's ground current that happens as well. So there's different ways that this can actually happen. If you do have that type of, if you are struck by lightning, if you're one of those people, this is a blast injury. So back to our blast injury segment you can rupture your tm yeah. you can be completely paralyzed and so one of the interesting oh, things about this is like evil. you know <laughs> this is, evil. is that it can paralyze the uh, the muscles around your iris and so your pupils may be fixed and dilated and, and you may not be able they may look kind of dead basically right and you can't but, move and you can't move your diaphragm is paralyzed you're paralyzed and you're going to get hypoxic from that mm -hmm. you're so not dead yet necessarily that's right so looking for the tympanic membrane perf can be a clue that they actually had a blast injury happen to them if you're not sure and some of them, you can't move your lower legs. I mean, it's crazy. So there can be deep burns depending on how you're hit again. Um, and like, uh, there's also some really interesting things there. that happen down yeah. the road. People can get cataracts and they can have these Lichtenstein figures where they have these, you know, these, these feathery that, that burn patterns. That thing's really pretty, but I wouldn't want to yeah. get struck by lightning to get that. Yeah, there's a bunch of weird things that can happen to yeah. you after you hit a lightning injury. What do you need to know about the triage of patients if there are multiple victims at a lightning uh, strike type of thing? Know that they can go into asystole, that may be their initial rhythm, but the heart by reautomaticity may just start up again. It's possible. Actually, and it, it does happen, yeah. actually. Yeah. So and they look like they're dead. Yeah. But 
They may not be. They may not be. And they can't breathe because their diaphragm is paralyzed. And so the fact that they can't breathe, their heart may be starting, but they still aren't breathing. Right. right? Okay. So, so it's an interesting phenomenon. And so when you're triaging those types of people, the typical things you look for may not be so typical in a lightning triage. That hypoxia may be the thing that actually is life threatening to them rather than the cardiac defibrillation. So so ABCs end up A again. A is kind of important. Get that person breathing. Yes. Yeah. So doing CPR, supporting ventilation is very important and look for those TMs and the cataracts I mentioned as well. If you happen to be so unlucky that you're pregnant at the time that you're struck by lightning, that is a bad thing. About half of those will end up in a fetal yeah. demise. Um, and people have weird cognitive and motor sequelae. Yeah, they, they have end weird up bu- neuropathies. Bu- it yeah. messes with their, their whole motor system. Is yeah, just Johnny's not the same. Uncle, Uncle Johnny's been really weird since he got struck by lightning. Yeah. Actually, there's a great story of it because these happen on golf courses a lot. Yeah. Um, and there's a story that actually was told to me by somebody who was at the scene of a, some, this happened to a group of people on a golf course somewhere in the south and there happened to be a priest nearby and the guy was out like dead mm-hmm. like dead 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 nothing nothing and the priest gave last rites and as he walked stood up from last rites the guy's heart started beating again and it was like whoa yeah i'm good i'm good yeah, yeah pretty amazing